Hey everyone, James Azar here with CyberHub Engage. Welcome to today's podcast. It's a extremely special episode. Extremely, extremely special. So um, we're five days out from the Capital One breach. My LinkedIn has been fed with vendors trying to tell me how if only, only I had their technology, this would have never happened. And Paige Thompson would have been able to openly exploit an S3 cloud Amazon container after being an Amazon engineer, among other many things that she had done. Good luck to her in her court battle. But I wrote an article and um, someone kind of uh, commented on my article. And most people, when they do that um, <clears throat> on Twitter, block people. I don't. <laughs> I kind of reached out to Daniel, who's who's in our studio today. Hey, everybody. And, um, and I said, let's take this from LinkedIn and put it on audio because I think we, 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 we say similar things. We have a different approach towards it and have an actual honest dialogue about this breach that doesn't talk about what technology would have solved it because I don't think technology was an ass played a play, played some part in it, but it played a very minimal part. The media has over exaggerated this breach to levels that are unprecedented and made it almost as bad as Equifax. Uh, made us all forget about Marriott giving everyone our passport numbers. Um, and uh, and so we're going to have an honest dialogue uh, on today's podcast. So a uh, quick message from my friends at Get Smart Eye, and we're going to get started and kicking uh, with this week's episode. All right, guys. So before we kind of get going on today's episode, I want to talk to you about privacy and security, obviously, right? But how many of you guys do what I do? Travel a lot, go work out of coffee shops. You need to get out of it. You need to kind of go brainstorm. You know, you go to your favorite Starbucks or in my case, my favorite coffee shop here in Atlanta. You sit down, you put in your AirPods, you're listening to your favorite Cyber Hub Engager Goodbye Privacy podcast or Journey uh, if you want to listen to music and you're having a good time. You're up and away working, uh, you know, going over apps, documents, coding, whatever it is that you do for work, analyzing logs, whatever it is, reading a really important email from your boss. And then all of a sudden you see that person kind of staring at your screen and you go, dude, don't look at my screen. Can I have some privacy? Well, up until right now, the answer to that would have been, I got to sit in the corner of the coffee shop or the side of the coffee shop to get that. Not anymore. Would get Smart Eye. You don't have to do that anymore. Get Smart Eye is a very cool app that you can use on your phone. It reads your biometrics, so it reads your face. This is how it works. It's looking at your face. So while you're reading a document, it's making sure you're the only person looking at it. Try to put another phone in front of it, take a picture of the document, screen goes black. Someone gets behind you, tries to look at your screen, you know, like that nosy person at Starbucks or wherever, screen goes black. No one can see what you're seeing on your device when you're using Get Smart Eye. So support our friends and my very good friend, Dexter, who is not a security guy who came up with this product on a trip overseas dealing with security guys and went, how come I can see everything you guys see? Isn't that like the complete opposite of security? And he's absolutely right. He's launched this amazing product. So go to getsmarteye.com forward slash James, getsmarteye.com forward slash James, Get smarteye.com forward slash James for a link to download the app and the opportunity to see a free demo of it. This is great for a person, a small business, an enterprise business. If you travel a lot, this is the right app for you. So again, go to getsmarteye.com forward slash James to get access to the app. I don't leave home without. And we're back. I'm here with Daniel Sergile, Deputy CISO at Ciox Health, right? That is correct. But it's just Ciox now. Just Ciox. You guys just raised $30 million. We did. That's awesome. We, we're we very, very happy. It's a, it's a new adventure and a, a kind of refresh into our life sciences business. So it's uh, we're very excited uh, to be, yeah, <laughs> we're super excited. 
30 million you know when people when i saw that 30 million it was even before i'd spoken to you like it was before i wrote the article because uh, you know the north fulton chamber they said hey we're proud to announce our you know our partners raised 30 million and yeah um I, I can talk about it now for the longest time we couldn't talk about it we just talked about this company so uh Yes, Merck is invested in our life sciences division. We have a uh, exciting new platform that we're we're developing with their with their assistance. Our uh, our, our parent company, our venture capital company, New Mountain Capital, uh -huh. matched Merck's uh, contribution. So that's where that thirty million came from. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of exciting things happening at Siox. That's so awesome. And you guys are based here in Georgia. Yeah, actually, it took me about five minutes to get here we're just here in alpharetta so awesome. uh for those that aren't from georgia that's north metro atlanta it's it's the best part of atlanta agreed i, I don't ha people always say like do you go to midtown do you go to you know atlanta they're like how do you not go i was like i have everything here and if i want to go outdoors and do some outdoor shopping i go to avalon because the burbs are awesome Right. The That's burbs the, are the burbs. They have this whole OTP, ITP fight yeah. that goes on inside the perimeter of Atlanta, outside the perimeter. If you're outside the perimeter, you're not as school as the guys inside the perimeter. I beg to disagree because all the good parties happen within the per like right on the border of OTP and ITP. I agree 100%. Um, That's where all the good parties are at. So not to mention, <laughs> I grew up outside the perimeter. Where'd you grow up? Roswell. Okay, so you're like a native to this area. I'm a native to this area. Someone said that Johns Creek used to be just like fields of That's nothing. all it used to be, yes. You had Roswell, and then you had Norcross, and then you had Gwinnett over that way. That's We basically took Jimmy Carter to get to 85 at that point, and everything in between was nothing but pine trees. So Jimmy Carter, Peanut Farmer, and the guy giving everyone rights to 85. Yes. You, you and could, somewhere in the middle he was president. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> so... <laughs> I love it because in Georgia, I think there's only like one or two roads after Jimmy Carter. But peach tree is every other road. Yes. Like there's like 28 different varieties of peach tree in Georgia. I When I first moved here, someone said, this is our address. And it was like peach tree parkway. And I was like, peach tree industrial parkway? What what, what peach tree parkway? What, and I called the person and I was like, well, just put it in your GPS. I was like, I'm getting 28 varieties of peach tree parkway with this number. Yeah, that's when we kind of fall into the whole grid system that we don't have here, yeah. uh, where it's northwest, east, and you know, south. No, no, here we have northwest, northeast, southwest, yeah, south. Yeah, exactly. South, south, um, I had a girlfriend that lived at Peachtree Battle, and it was nothing more than maybe a 500-yard road, but they had to put a Peachtree name on it. So, true story. 28 different peach tree variations and in cyber security we have no peach tree cyber company yet no actually you have peach tree software which was a e-discovery software <laughs> oh wait no i'm wrong it was actually dogwood was it yeah peach tree accounting software that's not cyber though it's not cyber uh, i'm waiting wrong. so so the next peach tree i don't interview vendors told you that but if you if you start a cyber company and you call it peach tree i will have you on the show for 10 minutes promise that sounds like a winner right because i just want to be able and in the everybody studio on linkedin is like i need this llc <laughs> let's go ahead and peach tree cyber <laughs> <laughs> we secure your agritech <laughs> supply here in atlanta chain. here oh in atlanta yeah. your pecans your peaches and your uh your peanuts and you didn't mention the number one export that has surpassed peaches, pecans, and peanuts. Blackberries. We are the n number one exporter of blackberries from the state of Georgia. Really? L little known fact. Yeah. Huh. I did not know that. Did you know that? Yeah, you, he, he's a Georgia. Micah is a Georgia native. Those who are watching us can't see Micah. You've seen Micah before, but... Um, you know, one day, Micah, we're going to have to invest and get a camera facing you. One day. If you want to sponsor our show so you can help us get a camera facing Micah, you can go to our website at cyberabengage.com. But, Daniel, let's talk about Capital One. Sure. So, so <laughs> I wrote an article that you said I was deflecting. You were like, deflecting, deflecting, deflecting. I think yours is the worst deflecting like five times. It was twice, but, you know, <laughs> listen. I love the vendor comment after. 
Did you did you enjoy that? I didn't even read it. No, no. So there was a vendor uh, from uh, I won't say the vendor name. I don't want to put her on blast, but people who will go to LinkedIn who will invest. <laughs> We'll see who it is. But she goes, totally agree with you, Daniel. And James, why are you judging me? All I did was put a GIF. And I was like, really? I'm guessing that vendor is probably like a first known connection to me because that happens a lot. It is. It it was a first known and and, and there was a doctor in the title. I know exactly who it is. Yeah. Thank you for that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, yeah. So I was getting hit by every single angle. And so people were, were texting me and calling me. They're like, what are, you, well, what are you going to do about it? And I was like, well, I'm going to invite him to on the podcast. And we're going we're to do this discussion outside of a thread on LinkedIn where people yep. hide behind the internet. And Not a keyboard warrior. Um, and if I'm going to be a keyboard warrior, I'm going to put my face right on it. There you go. I'm not going to hide behind an alias unless it's you know on the dark web. That's a whole other thing, but we won't get to that on this podcast. For that, you We can, might. Who knows? Yeah, goodbye privacy for that one, but... Um, well, well, here, here's the deal with Capital One. News broke out. 106 million records. Equifax. Marriott. Yep. OPM. Yep. Where people actually died from OPM. And for those of us, for those who don't understand cyber, they see that and they go, wow, that's really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Then we dig deep. We realize it's 106 million records of common information that you can get off my Facebook page. If I was a friend of yours on Facebook, right? Right. But at the same time, you could go to name that background check website. There's one that I use a lot to do background checks, and it's uh-huh. basically free, and it's crazy the amount of like just open source intelligence that's out there. But yeah, you're absolutely correct on that one. Of the really important data that was compromised, it was only 140,000 social security numbers and 77,000 bank accounts. So in the grand scheme of things... One of them is probably Vaughn. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> I'm kind of taking this one personal. Um, if, if, if you can prove that you were damaged, and we'll get to the Equifax under $25 thing me. later, but I, I, will, I will go on tirades, man. You, we got to stay focused so that I can get this. So we can have this, this really honest debate about capital one which is sure what i'm saying is the following most of the important data of the 106 106 million records was encrypted agreed social security numbers were encrypted Some. bank account outside 140,000 weren't that's still 140,000 percent agreed statistically it's a very small number Statistically, but my question is right. So some of it was encrypted, some of it wasn't. What happened? One hundred forty thousand social security numbers that weren't encrypted, seventy-seven thousand bank accounts that weren't encrypted. Yep. Grand scheme of things, when you compare it to all the bigger breaches, it's not as bad. Why are why are, why are so many people just kind of jumping on this? This is a horrible bandwagon. Oh, uh, and it, it's funny because if you take a look at any massive thing, especially in our twenty-four hour news cycle, they want to be out there first. They want to get that information out there, and a lot of information is thrown, um, but it's not it's not filtered. It's not people haven't gone through it and done the analytics on it very much like you have. And I think in the beginning, yeah, like you remember as much as I do, like every other post on LinkedIn was capital one hack, capital one hack, capital one hack. And somebody had a line on there, right? I thought of doing something different and talking about (laughs) what breaches actually cost. Um, But when I saw your post, I I started reading into it. And by this time, I think I was just capital one fatigued in the brain because as I'm reading through it, I was reading about all these other hacks and that this isn't capital one. And you know, what came up in my brain was, man, this guy's deflecting and kind of trying to minimize this. Why is he doing this? And so I kind of look through and, and, and then I, I'm like, fact, you know, she was able to get through and fact, it was a misconfigured firewall. And then I kind of went back through after we talked and stuff and I reread your article after having some sleep and I was like, Oh yeah, we agreed on a lot of stuff and just, I think we we're saying different things, just like, like what you were talking about. But I think one of the things that you, you had honed in on was the data hoarding, right? So, and I, I have a, you know, financial security background with, with Certus Bank. And before that it was with uh, Rabobank over in the Netherlands. And it's funny because in 2010 they had the LIBOR investigation and we ended up, getting requests from 
<laughs> from all over the, the Deutsche Bank uh, here out of the United States. In the end, it cost us 27 million, 27,000 backups because we had way too much data on hand. And we started looking at that whole, how much data do we really need, right? And depending on who in the business you ask for, keep it forever, keep it forever. And, you know, it's kind of our job as CISOs to be like, okay, there is a knock-on cost of, because of this. I mean, outside of storage, which is dirt cheap these days, and that's why a lot of people will keep their data for as long as they can because it's a couple bucks a meg kind of thing. Um, you know, for them, it's, 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 it's gold. You know, we have customers that have left. We have their information. Let's go take a look and see what we could do as a business to get these customers back, but we need the historical data on it. How many years do we have? Well, we only have, let's call it seven years. Oh, no, no, no. You know, we need to keep that, you know, moving forward. And and a lot of a lot of times the amount of data that's being stored is because the business feels that they need that data because someday something might happen where they need that data to go back and look on to help them in their situation. What they don't think about is, I mean, just from an e-discovery standpoint alone, right, um, you're opening yourself up to so much liability is not even funny. And we haven't even gotten into this whole Capital One thing. You know, they had 14 years of data, uh, actually. But it was applicant data, which yeah, is yeah. the other part, which was the yeah. other infuriating piece of this is this wasn't 106 active customers of Capital One. This was 106 million applications. People for that had applied. applied for so they Capital could have One. been customers, but they there was also been. people that they rejected. It's like, okay, why do you keep? You know, if you're not going to do business with that person, you had their data. I wonder if the rejected the ones were the unencrypted ones. Oh, you don't you don't qualify for a card? <laughs> we're going to unencrypt your data. <laughs> you're not worthy of our. You're encryption. not worthy of yeah. our encryption. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, I, I I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times you know dealing with mortgage businesses and dealing in the finance side. Yes, we do have requirements to hold data. Is it 14 years? No, no. not even close. Um, most banks, seven years, and that kind of coincides with how far back the IRS can audit and why you have to have your financial records. Um, but, yeah, 14 years, it's it's a lot of data. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of want to dive into this whole technical side because that's the way my brain works. But let's talk about that data hoarding. It's 14 years worth of data, right? Cur current customers, their bank information in, in some points. I mean, I say I'm probably one of them because I'm, I'm that guy that's, hey, just do the minimum payment because mm -hmm. I forget about dates and, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble with my credit score. There's tons of people like that. You know, it, is that actually what that was? So I, I think part of keeping this data is the difference of how cybersecurity departments haven't been able to leverage liability versus the sales and marketing because sales and marketing in organizations like Capital One, they call the shots. And cyber is, you know, we've been, originally cyber was just make sure no one hacks us. Then as hacks started coming, right, they were like, you're going to get fired if we get hacked. Then we had to kind of transition to be CISO in sales, business enablers. Yeah. And as a business enabler, when marketing comes and it says, we need all this data, we're going to use it, protect it. So you go out and you do it. But but even before you go out and you do it, one of the things that, that and it's not a pleasant or a popular conversation, and that's setting real, realistic expectations of what your risk, what risk you're holding right. there. And, and part of that is talking, you know, talking to the business and finding out what the risk, you know, what keeps you up at night. I know I don't sleep well. I get, I get maybe four or five hours of sleep a night. Um, but talking to that business and, you know, explaining exactly here's worst case scenario. Right. And of course, everybody thinks we're chicken little. Oh, the sky's falling constantly. Um, but, you know, in reality, if you have 14 years of data and you store it in the cloud and you know, human error kicks in or whatever it was. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely talk about that some more. You now, that risk has been realized, right? And if you take a look at like Ponemon and talk about what it costs, and I, I think in one of my posts, I, I talked about the $204 per right. 
per record. Per record. Yeah, that was the first post. Yeah. That was kind of how you and I got engaged on LinkedIn because up until this, I didn't know of your existence. I'm pretty sure you didn't know of mine. And then I saw your post at the cost of the breach because it was it was trending on my Twitter feed from all of our mutual connections. Yeah. And I said, that's a really good post. And I actually commented oh, and thanks. said, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. People are looking at the cost of this breach and you brought up a really good point. Capital One isn't really going to pay, I think... Uh, I think it was fifteen billion. Is fifteen billion? They're, they're they're not going to. We saw Equifax at one hundred and forty eight million. <laughs> he still can't pay it. Seven hundred million, and they're saying we can't really afford to yeah. pay that. And then the other part of it is, if Equifax got seven hundred million and they expose all of our information, I mean, social security numbers, credit history, I mean, everything and anything you could possibly imagine, the damage from Equifax is going to be felt for generations to come. Yeah. It's it's a seven to ten year impact on our economy is what the Equifax breach equals. Yes. This is impacting one hundred and forty thousand people. That's let's say with this two hundred and ten thousand people. Yeah, it's like point zero zero one percent of the population. Correct. Yeah. But it's Roughly. Capital One. Yep. It's a big name. It's a big name. It's one hundred and six million records. N- Every news organization that I watched, mainstream media, and this was one of the reasons behind me writing that article, was, um, uh, what does that mean? And you know, they've got all these pundits. And what even infuriated me more was all these vendors that went on CNBC and all the emails I got, and, and, and I blasted it on Twitter from PR companies saying, hey, if you're doing something on Capital One for your podcast, I'd like to nominate this CEO of this vendor to come and talk about how that that changes the landscape of the industry. I was like, no, this breach does nothing to the landscape of cybersecurity. Zero. Agreed. Because if my board tomorrow called me and said, hey, explain the Capital One breach, I'd be like, in hindsight, they had good hygiene. They answered the breach. They, they, they handled it. Like super quick. Super quick. Their incident yeah. response was bam, bam, bam. They knew it. The F- they called the FBI. They went from notica- notification to arrest in what, 10 days? Not even, yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah, I think they got notified on the 17th by email. On the 19th, they recognized it. And on the 26th, she was arrested. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's funny because kind of going back to this all kind of spawned out of LinkedIn while we're here. Right. And th- the one thing I didn't want to do, and it's the same thing that you didn't want to do, which was, Hey, let me copy this, this link to this news post and go ahead and put that. You kind of want to give information that's a little bit different and give a little bit more understanding to it. And it, it, it's funny because this isn't the first time and it's not going to be the last time. Right. And we, in the information security space kind of have like this gallows humor. It's, it's almost, um, I want to say Chris, Chris Sullivan was like, you know, what is, what is this whole carrying mentality that we have that, you know, it's like, Oh, there's blood in the water. Let's go after it. Um, but, but it's funny because when you take a look at this breach, you take a look at Marriott, you take a look at a whole bunch of these others, um, or the, the news of that breach, you have folks, and I'm not going to say his last name because I really don't feel like getting sued. Kiev Bob, who goes on to like uh, Shodan database, and actually there's a guy here in Atlanta named Matt that helped to write this algorithm that goes into Shodan and finds all these Mongo databases. You remember Marriott? Uh-huh. Part of that was an exposed Mongo database, and they found it on Shodan, and then it made the news. And you know, Bob. Bob will, you know, send you an email and say, hey, did you know that this information is out there? And if you don't respond fast enough, he's got this wackadoo citizen journalist that goes and starts threatening to, to put stuff out, you know, out in the world for, you know. You're in healthcare. You haven't been long in healthcare, but I had on the show uh, Michael Daughtry mm-hmm. from Lab MD, And he, he, you know, you were talking about the LimeWire thing at Rabobank. Well, he got that as a small business here in Atlanta, Georgia. They took him out of business. 11 years. He fought the FTC for 11 years and won. Yeah. but And rightfully th- so. There's a cost involved, yeah. Right. So. His cost was he went out of business. They took yeah. a perfectly good, thriving, cancer, life-saving business. Life-saving. They were cancer. What do they do? Cancer scanning, right, Mike? Right. I have his book right here, The Devil Inside the Belt. Give All him right a then. promo. Uh, give give Michael a promo. He he <laughs> sure as hell deserves it. That that guy's been through way 
too much. Yeah, and, and we're actually in this, you know, one of our business lines is oncology too, and I would right. hate for that to happen, you know, because, well. Yeah. I, I read his book, okay. and, and I met Michael, and I read his book, and kind of off topic, but very much to do with Capital One, was I learned how lawyers behave, how vendors behave, and I was infuriated by it. And yeah. I could understand when the first time I met Mike and I told him this, I said, I thought you were nuts. I thought you were crazy. I thought you were one of those people that says the whole world's against me. Then I read your book and I looked at the facts and then I looked at the court cases and I did all that research and I said, well nobody, done, sir. Nobody waste a good opportunity, whether that's well done. a Capital One. You, you, I know you saw it because I sure, I sure saw it. All right. these vendors. Of, uh, one was a training vendor, and I, I actually took a look at the guy that, that made this post because they posted like the Indeed jobs of all the uh-huh. Capital One people. I'm like, wow, that's brutal. And, you know, the guy's been around But did you, but did you look when year. those jobs posts were actually posted? Because I, I saw I that did. same post, yeah. and they're like pre-breach. Well, it's it's funny because if you go into Indeed and you take a look at Capital One, they've got like 3,000 jobs out there. Right. So, yeah. So that was a little disingenuous. But, you know, I, I saw that and I was just like, and then kind of looking in the background of the guy, he has nothing to do with security. Has a lot Sales of, guy. Pretty much. Yeah. Sales marketing guy. And and, and that's okay because I, I was originally a sales marketing guy before I got into security. Agreed. I love sales guys because they save me money. I, I beat them up all the time. I think sales guys are great, especially when I partner with them. However, in this kind of situation where, you know, you have, I mean, the facts aren't even figured out yet. Correct. And, you know, court of public opinion kicks in. And I, I'll be the first one to say, absolutely guilty of it. Didn't want to go into the kind of like, this is what they did wrong or this is what they did wrong. I literally talked about the the costs and you know what a breach looks like your first post was the first post that i saw outside of the in a, in a professional manner that talked about the cost of the breach it's real financial impact and i think one of the things one of the aspects when you think of the cost of a data breach is the human capital inside the company yeah that's the thing that kills me, right? And right. and I actually do want to dive a little bit in, into kind of like methods and means behind right. this whole thing. But what you will notice, and I know this from, from doing this for 25 years, is I could come up and say, hey, you have a massive issue with X product. And I'm not talking about with my current company. I'm talking about this has happened everywhere. Um, what are you going to do about it? Well, X product is going to be sunset. It does make us money. We're not going to invest money into it. So we'll go ahead and accept that risk. Then somebody comes in through X product and destroys, just lays complete carnage to your environment, pulls a whole bunch of data. It's not the guy that accepted the risk that gets fired. It's going to be that CISO and a couple steps underneath him or her. Um, and you know, when I first started out, I, start, I started out with Cox Communications, oh. and I was in IT ops, and they never had, like, internal security. So they gifted me with domain admin rights, and I could <laughs> go in and patch. My patch cycle was 24 hours from the time I had a, a file in hand. We would throw it out to a test environment, do about three hours worth of Q&A to make sure that nothing was broken. We pushed it out to the entire company, had a, you know, a, a 15,000-person company patched up in under 24 hours move forward two decades and you know we're more of advisors we help out in the operations side we do a lot with our security tools but like the day-to-day patching and stuff even though the reporting of it and you know the kind of chasing of it is still with security in a lot of organizations that responsibility is within like server engineering or IT engineering or cloud engineering right. or cloud ops. So you have a lot of these, like we don't know that this wasn't pointed out to capital one is, is I guess the point that I'm making. Well, we don't know that security didn't point this out. We don't know that they didn't get a security exception because the facts aren't there yet. Right. And we won't know. Yeah. Because none of this is going to be, this is all going to be privilege. Of course. And the only thing we're going to see is a headline later that with a, with a settlement of whatever it is. Yeah. And I feel like people who celebrate these settlements, in, in Equifax case, I felt like they got off cheap because they were negligent. Oh, the, the thing that killed me about that, and it, it, 
and I'm once again gratuitous blog. I do this talk on end of the breach, how to survive and come out uh-huh. the other side. And it talks about the anatomy of a breach and what parts you have to have there. And in one of those pieces, I talk about the fact that you can't keep coming out with a different number every other month or every six months. You know, you have to have a clear and concise message. And if you have one of those executives that likes to be on social media and stuff, go ahead and cut them off so they don't give conflicting messages or, you know, God forbid, when you actually finish your investigation, you don't contradict yourself with what he or she said prior to that, right? So the, the, you brought up Equifax and not just... Well, I mean, yeah. Equifax was, was, was classic because when Rick Smith was like, well, it's one employee who didn't forward the email and that's why it all happened. And you're like, no, no. Let's start with the concrete. I mean, if you had qualified... And, and this is another part of it, right? There, there's multiple kinds of breaches mm-hmm. there's the ones that are you know extreme negligence and i feel those companies should be fined up the wazoo they should be in front of congress they should be in front of senate they should stand in front of the court of public Opinion. in front yep. of the public and apologize because they take your data they don't respect it and 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 they're just they're, they're not doing anything it doesn't mean that there's bad people there it means that the people who are entrusted in those roles like a CISO or an or an information security aren't empowered to get their job done, and that, that was the, the the key takeaway from from Equifax. Yeah, you get hamstrung sometimes by the business, and I'm not saying that's every CISO, right? I'm kind of painting in broad strokes here. So for those at CISO Health, you guys actually empower us. Thanks. <laughs> um, so. It's, it's funny because, you know, I, I talk to all kinds of different CISOs here in Atlanta. I get invited to, to sit down dinners and we, we talk about, you know, different topics and stuff. And you'll just hear the a complete different peppering of how things work in their organization. Some very much like when I first started out have complete, you know, they have a complete operation center that can touch every single server. They can patch the server. Something goes down, security can jump into it. Then you have those, you know, especially in the regulated space, you have, you know, four eyes principle or separation of duties that kicks in and security can't do that. They can advise, they can report, they can kind of chase down through GRC and through, you know, uh, risk compliance. And then you've got others that are smaller shops that they do it all. They're, they have that security hat on and might not be the best qualified person to be running security for them. And they have a ton of like really, really sensitive data. Um, so, but with the, with the capital one thing, I think if we, if we kind of really dig deep into it, it's, you know, people want to talk about the breach as, as a whole. And, you know, the, like I said, to highlight the number, but the person who did this was a third party, former employee of a third party supply chain company within capital one Amazon web services. Yes. I feel at the end of the day, the person who's going to end up paying for all this is going to be Amazon. I don't know. You know, it's funny because there's an, we'll go ahead and and play the armchair quarterback. Right. So there was wrongly configured and everybody keeps saying firewall load balancer, whatever it is. Right. Let's for the sake of this conversation, it's firewall. Um, You have somebody who is highly intelligent when it comes to AWS. However, they didn't have to work for Amazon to do what she did. Um, That was something that you actually brought on your comment. You go, anyone with just the basic AWS S3 knowledge could have done what she did. True. I, I mean, Part of this was, though, that she kind of did this. I, I think someone within AWS leaked this. This was on Reddit at one point, mm. and I saw it on Reddit, and they said she was actually working in what was one of the project coordinators on the S3. On the S3 with Capital One. Oh, good to know, because I did not know that. So the, there, the last there was thing a I chain had of seen emails was... on Reddit, and then it got taken down, and I forgot to screenshot it. Yeah. Because as I was writing my article, I went to Reddit, and I was all like, all right, let's see what Reddit's got, because Reddit typically has like a good internal threat. I want to say it was these. like TechCrunch or Tech Republic. They had kind of like a screenshot. Of, I think it might have been over LinkedIn or whatever. Right. And it said that she was working on elastic load balancing for S3, right? So you got two, two of the technologies that are supposed to have been a part of this, right? But kind of getting back to where we were, the the initial misconfiguration, right? You can, you can talk about Ansible Tower and writing these books 
and you know we're going to automate this and, and make it so human interaction isn't there and you can throw all this technology and we talked about this before right. you can throw all the technology at the world <laughs> at this but a human still has to implement it they still have to configure it they still have to do maintain it that's the huge part especially if you're talking maintenance. about maintenance you know ansible playbooks right? right if if i have an ansible playbook that you know fires up a VPC and it's got the, you know, it's got ELBs and SLBs in there and it's, it's all hundred percent automated and I throw, you know, the security stack in there, but Hey, maybe the security stack is running a piece of software that's vulnerable. If you haven't done the due diligence to go ahead and, and keep those fresh and keep those updated, or this is my personal opinion on this. This is not the opinion of anybody but me. You have this whole, you know, kind of mentality that, well, in the cloud, anybody can do security. Right. An engineer is an engineer is an engineer. No kidding. Had that told to me not too long ago by somebody. And kind of going back to the, well, if I have an engineer over here who's been doing security for 25 years and one that's been doing it for two, which one do you want securing your cloud? Right. Right. Granted, there's a lot of new technologies kind of rebranded. Amazon technologies in there and yes a lot of it is push button but the underlying theories behind it and how you implement that and kind of working through that entire stack and thinking about that defense in depth and that layered approach of if somebody comes in through this side you know we should be able to pick them up here here and here if that's not in the forefront of that person's brain because they've been doing it or they're very savvy to it then it's going to be like, okay, I'm going to push this button. It's going to go ahead and, and put all this out there. I'm good to go. I'm moving on to what I know, which is I'm going to deploy dev code and into production. And you'll hear a lot of folks when they talk about, and I'm not going to pick on Amazon. I'm just going to say cloud at this point. That in the cloud environment, that with this this sec DevOps, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, we're going to blend the two, and it's going to be awesome. Well, a lot of times, you know, things happen in the cloud where DevOps will push something. Security will never know about it because everybody has that high power in the cloud. Um, and yeah, something like this is very easy. It's very easy for this to happen. And it's not unless, and I, I am going to talk about technology. There are some great technologies out there. We use some fantastic technologies. But to get those implemented, we also have some fantastic people that that do that right and you know it, it's almost like you know with everybody trying to get there as quick as possible quick as possible you know s security yes we need security but it's not they don't factor that in because you know you, you need a good base and that that good security stack that fundamentals yeah just the, the, your, your security fundamentals your security hygiene Yes. The basics. The basics. Need to be rock solid in that foundation. That way, if somebody does throw something in, you know, whether it's a developer, it's DevOps, it's secure, whomever, because, I mean, security is not infallible. We screw up at times, too. I'll be the first Absolutely. one to say it. But if they were to do that, that you have those layers in place and you have that monitoring in place and you have that protection in place to be able to say, hey, there's an issue here. Let's go fix this. But, uh, I mean, when... When you look at capital, you're, you're absolutely right. There, there's that human element, that human configuration, that piece of humanity that is going to be there all the time. It's just yeah. not not going to be there. With the Capital One scenario, it was a, you know, I'm writing a white paper with a, a guest of the show and a, and, a, and a fellow CISO by the name of Patrick Benoit. Okay. He's a pilot. We're writing this white paper on aviation versus cybersecurity, its life cycle. And then how did aviation... So techno, cyber is its own industry. Cyber is the security part of technology. And I think that's what most people always miss out on. They, they put cyber as kind of its own category. But cyber isn't its own category. Cyber is securing technology so that you keep adapting technology. And the adaption of technology... It's secure. So are you saying cybersecurity is like somebody asking for an ink pen? Maybe. Maybe. Inquire minds. But, but think of aviation, right? I mean, Boeing made a plane. Airbus makes planes. Yep. But when planes crashed early on in aviation, no different than cyber attacks, and people died, and there were, it cost a lot of money, and 
People didn't feel safe and people didn't want to adapt to technology anymore. People didn't want to fly. Yeah. There was a consortium of people that came together and said, okay, we can't just keep doing this. Let's find out the root causes of all of it and yeah. let's start addressing them and seeing what fail safes we can put in place to make sure that if a plane crashes, a lot of really, really bad things have to happen. NTSP. I'm not saying we need to regulate cyber. Oh, yeah, no. But, but what I'm saying is that that it took private, public, and government to come together, secure the supply chain of how do you produce every single piece of the plane to manufacturing it, yeah. to training the pilots, to retraining the pilots, to flight attendants, to making it safer, and all these different systems that came in place to ensure that today planes can fly in the sky and I flew yesterday, flew to Denver in the morning, came back last night. It was like driving to work, right? Got on a plane, two and a half hours later, landed in Denver, yeah. went about my business, came back to the airport, got on a plane about four hours later, thanks to weather delays and then a really weird weather route. Flew through Nebraska rather than Texas or Oklahoma. Okay, get it. Weather, stormy weather. We flew a different route to get to Georgia, but we got here. How, why can't we make cyber as safe as AV? Why can't we make the use of technology similar to, we're writing a white paper and we're arguing that there's ways where we can make it safer using cybersecurity, but it involves everyone kind of pitching it. No, uh, 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 first thing I agree with you. And something that you said kind of struck home with me, which is we don't need, you know, federal oversight of regulation for cybersecurity, even though we already have a lot of that. Some of it is absolutely insane. Some of it was well thought out. Um, but as a whole, I think, you know, it, 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 the mentality I have on it is it takes a village, right? So if we can learn from past mistakes by being a lot more open and transparent about it, which we're not today. I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, yeah. No, we're that's why I'm today, bringing it up. Right? Because Equifax was about the most transparent we've ever gotten on a breach. Eh, but the was it really? The congressional report. The congressional okay, report. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about the congressional investigation, the 98-page report. Yeah. That was a very detailed report. It highlighted the chain of events that happened. It, it looked like an NTSB airplane crash report. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be... I'll be the first one to tell you, we, we institute AR is very much like in the military, which is your after action review for everything we do, not only in cyber, um, across IT and ops, because we want to learn from any mistake that, that comes along, right? Because God forbid we have that one mistake that somebody else experienced within, you know, our sector, our company, whatever, we didn't learn from it, we didn't document it, and then we did it again. And it caused something like this. Right. But that's what people do. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you remember, there was a plane that was going from Rio, Air France flight that, that f crashed in the Atlantic about 15 years ago. It was flying from, I think, San Paulo or Rio de Janeiro to Paris. The plane kind of just, just disappeared off the map. Yep. Disappeared off the map. And it turned out to be the speed sensors. Yep. Stalled the plane. plane and it crashed. And because it crashed. somebody had a piece of tape over the thing from or, a maintenance. Right. Yeah. Just, and then... When that happened, when people realized that was the case, everyone went in and kind of double checked it. Capital One made everyone go into their am, you know, in, into their cloud environment and be like, "Hey, are we configured correct? What, what are what does yeah. our AIM look IIM look like? Like, I mean, I mean, Capital One was kind of a audit call for 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 a lot of organizations to go and look at well at, at their their cloud security. The other part of that, and I'll be the first one to say it. I'm probably not the first one to say it, but I'm going to be the first one in this conversation to say it. When it comes to the cloud, there is a lot to learn. It is a steep learning curve. And a lot of folks want to go to the cloud to save money, but they won't invest in either their people or consultancy to help them get to where they are. And then you kind of have the, these folks that are like, okay, I know how to stand up a server, but this is different. I'm going to try it my way. And then, you know, yeah, technically in there in the cloud but is it you know configured optimally is it secured optimally you know so i think for for a lot of folks out there that kind of have that cloud mentality and want to get out in the cloud do not forget about the skill set of your people because it's completely different than on prem once you get in there and yeah i can spin up a linux server i can spin up a windows server in aws or azure or 
actually, can I spin up Linux and Microsoft's cloud? That's kind of, anywho, <laughs> um, but, but I guess my point is invest in your people so that they know what they're doing in that, that, that new technology. Um, and if you can't invest in people, you know, at least get some consultants that can come in and sit side by side on the keyboard. That way your people can kind of learn through, through that. Uh, you know, one of my directors had never touched cloud before in his life. He's fantastic fantastic in cloud now but he spent that extra time i mean the amount of books and the research and the testing and everything that he had done and just soaking up with a sponge that was painful that was painful for him but he got it done um but we also invested in him as well and and i think that's part of it a lot of people go to cloud for savings and in that savings that whole training and skill set that knowledge gap needs to be filled it's there's also in immature organizations this whole concept that if i'm on the cloud i'm secure all i gotta do is just put my stuff on on the cloud and did you see my third post i did on that which was the separation of duties between uh yeah so that's kind of why because there were so many people talking about that well i'm on the cloud i'm okay and you're right people don't really invest in their people they don't really invest the time or money needed to really understand what going to the cloud really means and and, and, and uh, But I think in the case of Capital One, overall, if we were to sum up the whole picture, most data was encrypted. Agreed. They had, two fel- they had two significant failures. The firewall was one. The unencrypted data was the other. Actually, I was really impressed on how she was able to go start off with one AIM and just kind of move herself right. up. And Yeah. yeah she, she, she did some good work there. Yeah. There's there's no there's no argument about that. I mean, you know, I don't know if she's going to end up doing any jail time or what'll end up happen ha- happen to her. But what do they say? Five years, two hundred fifty grand. If she's found guilty, and this, I don't think will ever make the trial. This will be settled within, I think, three four months in a small. You know, she'll end up getting conditional release and work for someone on the side, like. And then she'll hit the speaker tour, write a book. There'll right. be a movie about it. Yeah, and we'll have a new, you know, Kevin Mitnick or or someone like that was just can talk about their whole. This is how I did it, and it'll be kind of the new cloud hacker, right? The ultimate cloud hacker, Paige Thompson, and and good for her, I guess, in one way. But in in another thing, it's it's when we we look at the whole record and we just kind of strip away all the headlines and we just look at the basic facts of it. There's some stuff that Capital One failed at, and I was very clear about you were, that. You were. And, but there was some stuff that they did very, very, very well. Agreed. As someone who speaks on incident response, I think you can agree with me that their incident response was exceptional. Actually, what I was really – so, yes, exceptional. Being able from notification, kudos to them to you know actually have that bug bounty out there. It and works. take it seriously. And and take it seriously. Most people have it and they don't look at it. Well, well, the worst part is is the amount of stuff that comes your way. Whether it's people looking to find that one little loophole and and use the law and kind of do this class action, and it's like, well, really nothing there. Versus somebody who's like, hey, you actually have an issue here, and it got sent to the right people in the right time. They started investigating, and from the time of notification to arrest, under ten days is massive and not only you know we're giving all these kudos capital one but you know the fbi cyber crimes division did a lot of work on that and especially if you read the affidavit i mean it's it's amazing so they did did great did you see the video of them actually going to her house i did there's the video of the fbi raiding her house like her roommates i guess did you see the news today about all the guns and bombs and explosive materials pulled out of that house no yeah, evidently one of the roommates is just as bad as she is. And well, uh, th- th- they are in the Pacific Northwest. That's pretty much like Antifa headquarters. So, <clears throat> so that evidently somebody had made a threat on the internet while they were there. They went in. They found several, several, you know, short barrel rifles, explosive materials, all tough cocked. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And uh, so that made the news today. That, that's I've, I've, I'll be honest with you. I have been off the news today. I've just, I'm yeah, like, I, 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 I've been on the news all week. Oh yeah. No, you, my brain hurts after a while and I'm just like, well, I, I need a rest. 
And here's the other part of it is when you read these news stories, they're all the same. It's the same exact thing. It's the same quotes. It's like someone from Reuters wrote something. It Everyone hit, else took it and added it, a paragraph of opinion. It hit the to PR it. wire, and if you're lucky, you'll be able to find like that, that one little nugget in this one and kind of stitch it all together and get some kind of semblance of that puzzle piece. You're not ever that lucky. So no, I mean the one thing is I always, you know, I'll, I'll share what I did is when when it came out, I went to Reddit, I went to Twitter, I started looking at, you know people who i knew krebs had a great write-up on it yep but he always does though he's very yeah. thorough he, i mean there's a reason brian krebs is brian krebs he's yeah. just he's not a hack he he he, he i ended, used to read him almost religiously when i was in the financial sector because he had right. so much on the skimming right on the card skimmers and stuff but yeah um that and the the affidavit was right great i mean i read what krebs had i read the affidavit um, I looked at the actual Reddit threads to see what people were saying on there. I went to a few different, you know, chat rooms and different places where people talk and people post different things, you know, different yeah. screenshots. Evidently, Slack is the place to go these days. Slack, Who knew? Slack. And, and there's a few others. Slack and a few others. There, There's a few others out there that people go to and, and kind of share stuff. But I think... No, I'm talking about Paige. Paige Thompson, yeah. Yeah. So, evidently that put all that on Slack. Well, she was others. actively on, on, on public chat rooms talking about, yeah, I'm going to strap a, a vest myself. I've, I've strapped a vest to myself somebody. with all this data. Yeah. And, and the other part is she goes, it's all encrypted. She goes, it's all encrypted. She goes, there's nothing I can, this data is worth nothing. Cause it's all encrypted. Yeah. She, she was talking about, and it's funny if you took a look at like her directory file that she had put, put out there, there was a lot more stuff out there. Like, you know, I'm looking through, and all of a sudden, I see one of my vendors' names, and I'm like, "Whoa, hold on, is that from Capital One because they do business with them, or is that from something else?" Their S3s. Time will tell because there's been a couple kind of hinting at it wasn't just that. It what I think what we're gonna when we look back at this whole once the FBI think forensic slabs finishes and disclosures come out because there's gonna be more disclosures. Oh, I'm sure. Capital One. It's it's like Chase in 2014. Yep. Right? 88 million at the time was like the largest. Is massive, right? Was massive at the time. But people forget under there, there was Scott's Trade and E-Trade and a bunch of other trading companies that those hackers used. Yep. But we all remember Chase. We don't remember everyone else under it. And I think the Capital One is going to be very, very similar to that. They're at a headline, but there's going to be a bunch of small disclosures that are going to come out. Oh, what was that latest no one, one that I saw this morning? I was like, oh, that's awesome. Um, it'll come to me probably an hour or two after the podcast. But <laughs> there were, I mean, like literally right on the heels of Capital One, there was another one. And I was like, all right. Yeah, but but it gets lost, right? 24-hour it's, news it's, cycle. It's man. get lost. I think LAPD was just breached. Um, Georgia. At, the Georgia State actually, Patrol. Actually, a lot of townships. And what kind of yeah. kind of freaks me out about that one is, I mean, they you want to talk about access to stuff? They got criminal mm -hmm. history that they could possibly get access to. So, well, I mean, the the, the so we, we reach a point where you go, not that so, I'm a criminal. Well, no, you're you're not. But cybersecurity is is like I said, you know, before we started the podcast, I was saying most people look at cyber as siloed, most organizations silo cyber yeah. rather than lay it vertically. And it should be vertical. It should be part of every single op within an organization. Agreed. Um, it should be part of their DNA, especially in this day and age. It, it can't. If you're a technology company, if, you, if you're a SaaS company, if you're, um, you know, it, it's funny, but I just saw a trucking company that has gone completely technical and they have a CISO. I'll tell you, it, and kind of in that same vein with, you know, Tesla's talking about autonomous trucking. Right. Could you imagine if bad guy got a hold of those on our, on our highways and we that saw became that a trend? Last Fast and Furious movie. Remember they got all the cars to crash into the Russian ambassadors thing. I, I'm going to admit I've never seen one Fast and Furious movie. Really? Not so th if you're going to Google anything or if you're going to watch any scene from Fast and Furious, they did it and they shot it in Cleveland, apparently, because when they were shooting the, rocks, well, 
I, I don't know. They shot it in Cleveland the, because someone on Twitter was saying, I'm looking out and they're shooting Fast and the Furious oh, cool. under our building and all these cars are crashing and burning and exploding. It's, it's literally on Twitter. It was really, really cool. And so then when the movie came out, the kind of I, I saw it, but allegedly, so it shot in Cleveland to make it seem like it's New York and Times Square and the uh, Russian defense ministers walking around with the nuclear football and they take the, the, the bad people in Fast and Furious, um, hack a bunch of cars and have them go and create a large crash so that someone can go and steal the uh, nuclear football the Russian nuclear football from the defense minister as he's driving through Times Square. Like if you've ever been to Times Square, you realize it's impossible to do everything that just happened. Had you not told me that was Fast and Furious, I would have thought that would have been like the new spinoff from the White House has fallen to Cleveland has fallen. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. But there's there's this whole like thing behind, I want to say, the human aspect of the capital one, right? Which you kind of brought up, yeah. which was, you know, training and investing in your people and really making sure that someone really owns an area of responsibility. Well, yeah. And that's the thing, you know, it, it, it's funny because, you know, I, I've seen this so many different places where I'll just use mail, right? Where, well, who owns mail? Well, it's an engineer thing. Well, no security uses it to, you know, to stop spam so it's secure well and there's never an ownership there is is is, i guess my point um and then when you look at the cloud and how much is shared where the whole pointing of fingers can happen so quickly because somebody dropped the ball along the way or somebody maybe didn't do their part yeah ansible's great and security did their thing or maybe security didn't maybe they didn't update the playbooks who knows i could sit here and pontificate on this all all day long but my point is is you know whose fault would that be is it devops for pushing out a playbook that was out of date was it security for not you know updating there's so much somebody needs to own it very much like what you're talking about there's very little ownership security is always the first to be blamed um and fired and fired the chief internal scapegoat officer that's what CISO stands for. Oh, wow. I like that. I think I'm going to use that. We, we do sell T-shirts on our website, cyberhubengage.com. Chief internal scapegoat officer. You can buy them there. How much are they, Micah? 1995. $19.95. That is a steal. <laughs> I'm actually going to buy one. <laughs> and chief internal scapegoat officer, they're, they're first to get fired. Uh, I think we're noticing a trend here locally, at least in, in, in Atlanta. I'm noticing a trend. After three years, we see a chief information security officer kind of leave the role and kind of walk away. Speaking of Indeed, that is where I see the trend. Like, nothing will be said, then all of a sudden one company has like 15 people that they want to hire. Right. And funny enough, they're all in the security space. So It's like they get rid of entire departments, mm-hmm. right? It's like, okay, we're going to get rid of all these guys. And you're like, so they either had an incident and they're not reporting it and they fired all these guys. Or they replace one guy and the entire team, team along, with yeah. along with them, right? One of the two. But typically, you can't really take 15 people with you when you leave somewhere. True. Because there's one or two people that are really ambitious that are going to want the role you just left. There is that, or they got the whole pension or the non-solicit or whatever. But, yeah, I get your point. Yeah. Right? There's not going to be en masse people, you know, jobs. Unless something bad happened. Agreed. Right? Unless something bad happened. But... I think one of the key things I wanted to highlight in my article was that also Capital One was a victim of a crime. Yes, absolutely. And you you said something earlier and it was so true. You go, we, it's like the vendors are the sharks looking for blood in the water to kind of push sales, kind of convenient end of quarter, right? The week right before end of quarter. <laughs> Actually, that is right? horrible timing. Yeah. And, and so... You know, here here you go. Let's see if we can get someone to spend some money four days before the end of the quarter. I could see the strategies in my head where the vendor's <laughs> like, hey, you know that one big account that you're, you've been trying to land? Use the Capital One. Do it now. This could be you. Use our product. And then, yeah, yeah. nail that sale. Nail that sale right then and there. Yeah. Th- th- that was the, the one aspect of it. But then the other one was the general public who doesn't understand this, who goes into this like you said, and, and I started saying it earlier, 
which is you know the Monday morning quarterback on 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 big news networks, the local TV stations that are interviewing cyber experts. Oh my lord! And and no one's really talking to people like yourself and going like, let's go behind this breach from the moment that they actually discovered this happened, and they got their IR team saying we have a problem. Yeah, and they called in. You know, they grabbed their playbook and they probably called it their chief legal officer, the CIO, everyone who's responsible of it. And that time frame, that amount of work, the stress. Oh, there was not much sleep had had that week. I mean, I don't think they still got sleep till now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's especially, you know, dealing with the e-discovery and stuff like that. You have. Meeting, data collection, data collection, data collection, meeting, data collection, data collection. And it's usually with your chief of legal, your outside counsel, your PR, and everybody has a say in what they want or some way that they want to kind of contribute or maybe even control the message or, or whatever. It's exhausting. I've, I've done this so many times in my life, it's not even funny. That's one thing we don't hear from any breaches. The, the capital... I, I, I talked about this in one of one of our first ever podcasts where I said when we just started the show, which was no one talks to the families of those who work in cyber mm. of when an incident happens of how little they see their parent or spouse, male or female, how agitated and stressed they are, how even if they're home, their laptops open and they're still working on something. So I'm going to share a story with you. This is from, from, from my Cox communication days. Um, there was so many. While I was at Cox, you had NIMDA, you had Code Red, you had SQL Slammer. SQL oh. Slammer was kind of a big deal, right? right. And especially for a communications company that the Super Bowl, it happened on Super Bowl Sunday. And to, to quote one of my former bosses there, why are you gang tackling this thing? It's like, because it's Super Bowl Sunday and you're about to lose $10 million. But I digress. Speaking of the wife, um, sitting there working through it, actually, she had gone through that, brought pizzas and everything else, and then February 14th, I think it was the I Love You virus came out, or it was something along those lines where we ended up staying for 36 hours straight, just kind of battling this thing out on the network, and, you know, Valentine's Day, at the time we were dating, didn't have, you know, much time together to begin with. And yeah, she shows up, she brings pizza for, for my entire team and then brings, you know, an actual home cooked meal with candles. And I remember sitting in my office, you know, over candles and stuff, um, having this candlelit dinner in the middle of all this, this maelstrom and this complete craze that's going on. Um, the, uh, at, at the time with, uh, uh, sequel slammer, we worked that thing for 18 hours straight starting the night before and brought in a ton of people on a weekend, pulling people away from their families and their loved ones. And yeah, it has a toll, but especially when you're like in the news and that stress is there and everything else. Well, it's family and friends that all of a sudden start texting you and calling you oh, yeah. like, Hey, what's really going on? Should I be worried? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's like being a poli when you're in cybersecurity, it's like you're a cop of somewhere, right? You're a cop of something. And if something happens, even if it's not your company, everyone calls you. Everyone's like, hey, um, this Capital One thing, should I be worried about it? And you're like, no, you're fine. Unless you get a notice that says your social security number was compromised, which wouldn't be the first time because it happened during Equifax and other breaches. Yeah. Or your bank details were compromised, at which point there's really no impact because Capital One has probably notified all 77,000 banks and they've probably made changes and put alerts on those bank accounts to begin with. So, and, and it doesn't appear like she monetized or sold any of this data either. Yeah, it, it, it seems like she literally just had it had hanging it. out and just was about to do this before all this went well, down. Well, she was trying to get rid of it when she got caught. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> she she was trying to get rid of it when she got caught. She was like, "I need to put this somewhere else and just erase my my DNA from it." And you're I, like, I kind of vowed to like not talk about her. Kind of like you don't talk about terrorists because but I it's don't, not the same. I, I know, but in in my mind, for you know, a hacker to come in and and do that, you know, I I wasn't going to talk about this. But the one thing that you know. 
the the whole the whole mental the 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 mel- mental illness and and the uh, i mean just to to look at some of the photos and what she uh, what she had wrote there was a lot of mental stuff going there she was, even talked about putting herself into a mental, a, asylum. A, a, a mental asylum so who knows what was going going on through her mind but, but i think that's really important because i feel like you're right we don't i, I mean i've never brought up a terrorist or anyone his names before on anything yeah. I've done. The reason I bring her up is because I feel like this is a little different from other breaches. This wasn't a nation state. Yeah. This wasn't a corporate espionage. This was a very smart person who worked at a company that Capital One uses for their cloud services that took advantage of something that was going on. How? Maybe one day we'll be lucky enough to figure it out. She'll write the book Who knows? And, and, and we'll be able to read it. And, Maybe and, she'll get the help that she needs and yeah, she writes that book. You know, or, you know, the FBI, the agent or, or you know, Michael Johnson from Capital One will, will give it a talk at one point or another and, 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 and say how she got it. But the, I think the, the part of it is, is what, you know, what I started saying was Capital One's a victim. Yeah. I'd hate to be in in that CISO shoes. Right. I'll just be the first one to say. I'd, I'd hate to be in the CISO shoes. I'd hate to be in that company's shoes, whether you're in marketing and PR, the impacts. Oh, of yeah. it. If you're in sales, if you're in client relations, this impacts an entire organization. This is a massive company. This isn't about the fine. It's it's funny. There's, the headlines on Thursday morning were, as, as I was at the airport flying to Denver, New York Attorney General opens investigation. I'm like, of Of what? What investigation are you opening? Call the FBI, asshole. So what you're literally going to do is you're going to detract from the investigation that's happening now so this politician who wants to make headlines can have his headline. Right, so and he can call his And it's going to take conference. away from, from, like, I don't know, the actual work being done. The information sharing. Yeah. The lessons learned. Because now Capital One's legal team is going to be like, no more anything with the FBI. Done. Yeah, it's and and I think that's the aspect that's extremely frustrating for people who are practitioners is we don't get that end information. We don't get that back end intelligence. We hear about it, but we never see it. So what you're hearing, you're trying to compare, you're trying to understand, you're trying to be like, what can I take into my organization, my business, yeah. my personal life to be more secure? But we're not sharing information because we have ambulance chasers for lawyers. Three class action lawsuits have already been filed against Capital One. Three. Three ambulance chasers have already filed class action lawsuits. For what? Nobody's been harmed. I mean, No one's been harmed. And, and, and that's the funny thing. Like, If you take a look at a lot of these class actions that have happened before in the past, the number one piece that they come out with is you have to show proof of harm. So... Yes, your data is out there. Yes, I can go on to, you know, advanced background checks, whatever, and do a search on your name and find out exactly what was in there, except for 140,000 of them. You know, I'm not going to discount that. And, you know, at the end of the day, they that you have to show harm. When Equifax happened, I was interviewed here on local TV. Fox 5 was it Fox 5 and NBC 11 right and and I did both I did a morning show and I did a night segment and the reporter was trying to dig to get me to say something and I was like well what should people do I was like go to the DMV change your license change your license number yep they got a while I was like well your license number has been exposed here change it now if someone used your previous license in two years from now to take a credit card under your name you can prove that it was part of that breach because you've got a new license. Or just do what I do. Freeze your credit across all three bureaus. Just saying. Well, on top of that, on top of that, I think one of my biggest fears with Equifax personally from a, from a, as a consumer was the global impact of it. Oh, yeah. It's huge. So, and I think that's really what it boils down to, right, is when people want to think of cyber and they want to think of security and they want to think of that. They want to think that these large companies that handle their money and handle their credit would never get hacked. Correct. That and they're going to. And I think that whole FUD aspect of it is, is that's where that's what's driving 
all of the oh i am shocked i'm absolutely shocked that w- one of the largest credit card holders in the world got breached or i'm shocked that one of the three only three credit bureaus in the united states got breached or i'm shocked that you know this this insurance company or whatever whatever industry they're in if they're in the top of that industry people are always hurt by that because they're the leader the leaders don't get breached how, how did this possibly happen i think the key takeaways from capital one at least for us and i hope people who listen and and, and, and are watching the podcast kind of take away from it is really just there's a headline there's reality that's I think I think that's that's fairly safe to say. I always say there's always three sides of every story. Their side, their side, and the truth. Yeah. So in this case, Capital One's got a side, the media's got a side, and then the truth is somewhere. Well, the point. media's just clickbaiting you to click. Yeah, <laughs> they, they they get paid per click. So if they they get you know a hundred million people to click on an article, they got a hundred million people to click on an article. They're making money. A week from now, if they don't, if something. Major doesn't happen. The it, story's it, dead on something Sunday. Else. Yeah. The story's dead on Sunday. Yeah, the last you'll hear of Capital One is Sunday, on you know the morning, some Sunday morning shows where they talk about the week's greatest headlines. I think the two democratic debates over the last few days have really helped the Gateway Pundit. So <laughs> we need regulation. Yeah. yeah. Um. No. Luckily, no one. I was waiting to see if someone in the Democratic, um, debate, would bring up the Capital One breach. No one did. Not one person brought up the Capital One breach. Two debates, 20 presidential candidates. No one brought up the Capital One breach. No one brought up cybersecurity. How many How many of those folks do you think are just numbed to the whole breach? I, I don't think... They're I don't like, think, oh, there's another one. This one's bad, but yeah. I think part of the challenge with cybersecurity is the challenge cybersecurity had pre-Equifax, pre-OPM, pre-Chase which was no one cares, take a little bit of money, go do it, we'll recover. No company has ever, no major company has gone bankrupt from a cybersecurity breach, none. The smaller companies have. AMCA, in your industry, you're in healthcare, AMCA, the collection company, the Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy within a week of their breach. Yeah, I mean, that's to be expected. It's, It's a smaller company, the companies that are their customers are the bigger companies with with the deeper pockets, but the breach is clearly with that 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 right. credit bureau. Uh, I mean that credit collector. Um, and nine times out of ten, they're it's almost like I'll buy this debt from you for like X amount, um, you know, pennies on the dollar, and then they got to chase that and chase that and chase that. So their expenditure is still out there until they collect, right? Right. Or it could be that they. Have, Whatever the case may be, could be a- in in that case, you know, if they have a contract with them, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the day that that hit the newswire, those contracts were severed. I'm sure it was. The damage was already done. Yeah, I think, and and that's part of it. I think the other part of it is the the they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, but then they opened a new company, a new LLC, and and kind of sp- yeah, spun let, stuff let the up. bones get sued, and yeah. hey, we moved on to here. Yeah, hey, we're not AMCA anymore. We're AMCAP. Man. Now or S A M C A S secure secure, yeah. yep, and um, and 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 they've moved on to there. But kind of in 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 you know in all of our conversation, I think the one thing we can we found a lot of common ground. But I'm hoping that the people who listened and watched kind of get an idea of what what it's really that these breaches they're not just a headline that expecting 100% security is not to be expected. I literally said that to a customer yesterday. I will never tell anybody we're 100% secure. We can't be. Because we have to be right 100% of the time. They only have to be right once. That's like terrorism. Yeah. It, it, we and, and, and I hate to compare cybersecurity to what the FBI and other law enforcement, people who, who actually put their lives on the line to ensure that you know, yeah, no one comes in and, and kills innocent people. We're trying to protect data, and they're trying to save lives. But there is, 
we deal, it's a similar, I think if, if psychology came to study a cybersecurity professional and an FBI agent that find the same psychological outlines and probably like, a high protection drive. Yeah. yeah. And, and just the same stress levels, the same everything because you, I had a head of hair like a week ago. That's it how stressful a, this it is. It wasn't a machine. To, okay. Just you were showering one day and it just started coming off and it was that was horrible. it. That was over. <laughs> it was it was over. I I, I completely I've been agree with since you. I was twenty six. <laughs> I say that one. I want to say thanks for agreeing to come on. Yeah, and, absolutely. And it's a pleasure. It's it's been our debate was fun. I think I enjoyed our first phone call. Yeah. When when, when we spoke, I was just like. You know, typically, I didn't know what to expect on the first phone call. I'll be honest. I was like, oh, God, is this going to get contentious? Oh, actually, this guy's pretty cool. Um, I don't mind people disagreeing with me. And I don't mind someone calling me out on something. I, I actually encourage it because I feel like if you can't have an honest, open dialogue conversation about something, we can agree or we can disagree. It doesn't mean that, you know, we can't be friends or we can't be civil. To the contrary, it just means that the discussion and the need for our community to to further come together, to for, further support each other. And I think this is the part where I grow extremely frustrated. And I started kind of saying it before we kind of went off on that tirade was all these lawyers get in, all these politicians try to make a name for themselves. And all the information ends up in a safe in a law office that no one gets their hands on. Well, that's where all the money ends up. I mean, really, the the, the incentive to the lawyer, seven hundred million, half of that's going to him. The other half's going to the victims. That's why it's such a small penance that you see getting paid out. Uh, that's why the news this last twenty four hours is, you know, the money for Equifax. You <laughs> take the free credit. You know, credit monitoring. So um, I, I took the hundred and twenty five dollars, and I'll tell you why. Because I wanted to see it. I don't care for credit monitoring because it's free. Yeah. You can freeze your credit now for free. You can't get charged for it, right? So I don't need them to monitor my I do credit all for three 10 of my, years. Yep. Right. I, I freeze all my credit as well. I don't need them. Well, to- I think I made that joke on somebody's on somebody's LinkedIn. No, actually, it was on my own. Somebody had said something about credit monitoring. I'm like, <laughs> you know, they they that's actually one of their, their services is credit monitoring. But that would be like the Fox Garden well, now. So. I, I will say one thing. Elizabeth Warren, when she was questioning Rick Smith, I don't know if you ever saw that exchange after I, the Equifax breach. No. She, she actually nailed them. And I thought she did so beautifully. And I don't always agree with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I'm, I'm not a communist or a socialist, so let's just put that out there. People who listen to our other podcast, Goodbye Privacy, clearly know that. But she said, so the breach happened, and you guys own LifeLock. And LifeLock was increasing their marketing expenditure and using the Equifax breach as a way to get more sales, right? Yeah. Uh, and... She was like, so why are you doing that? Right? Like, like how unethical can you possibly be? Yeah. Well, it, it, and part of me wants to make the jokes of <laughs> you got lemons, might as well make lemonade. Right. But no, com- completely agree. And I, I feel that, that we've, we've, we've talked about Equifax because these are all, Atlanta, well, for the most part, Atlanta companies that, that we bring up in this. Uh, in fact, know some of the guys over there. Um, but, you know, that whole outside of the whole lifelock thing and then hey check to see if you were on there oh by the way this little disclosure down here says you can't sue us and go to this website oh sorry we're, we served up malware and the fact that they oh it's 20 million no it's 100 million oh it's actually more you know the constantly changing you know story it, it's just hard it, there's so much fodder there it's, it's hard not to use them as an example of uh, well, I, I when think, a breach comes up. I think th- the one thing you learn about Equifax is all the things not to do when you go through a breach. All the things not to do. Yeah. And then there's all the things you should do when a breach happens, and that's Capital One. You have their bounty program worked. Yeah. They took it seriously. They did. They responded. And I, they need kudos for taking it seriously because I kid you not, the amount of stuff that comes in that you have to wade through and you have to respond to every last one of them because one of them might be an actual breach. Right. Right. You so. have to you have to take every threat seriously until 
you can wh- yeah. w- whether or not you can call it a threat or not whether or not it's it's yeah. actually happening or not it's and i think what most people don't know is that hackers actually use those bounty bug programs to send you on, on malware on on, on on not only to malware but well, they'll they'll try to they'll try to send you on wild goose chases yeah, smoke and mirrors right Hey, take a look over here. Don't mind the spiking traffic over here. Right. Ignore yeah. that. I mean, they do that with uh, with 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 the trick bots for financial institutions. I mean, yep. the trick bots was it's brilliant. I mean, speaking of friends at the Secret Service, they're like, man, this thing's insane. It's it's no one notices unless your network administrator, your network administrator, and most of the time, network administrator doesn't report to security. It's funny. I have a, I have a buddy of mine that's in financial industry. And he called me recently, and he's like, yeah, we're having a lot of traffic on the front end through our mobile app. I'm like, watch your back door. And he's like, what? I'm like, look for spikes in traffic. Look for a lot of IRC. Look for your outbound, not your inbound. Keep an eye on that. And he's like, oh, thanks, man. So, yeah, yeah. completely get where you come from. Right. I mean, but here, here's, here's and, and you brought up a really, really good point. When you're in our community, we share information with each other. We can never attribute that information. And when we go to a board meeting... It carries zero weight because boards, they want to see a Gartner, a Forrester. They want to see something that backs up their expenditure that yeah. helps them with their liability. The fact is, if we're going to take anything out of Capital One Breach, at least for me, for everyone who's listening, watching, whatever it is, we need to somehow build a framework where information sharing doesn't end up in the hands of ambulance chasers or trying to make a buck rather than help everyone get safer and more secure. And I think that's that's the key takeaway from this entire breach was let's switch the conversation and let's talk about one data hoarding. Agreed. If if the government wants to regulate anything, let's regulate how long you can hold on to data for. We do that with accountants. We do that with the IRS. We do that everywhere. Why don't uh, we do that with big business? Because I, I think we should be able to do that for ourselves. We don't need the likes of I, Congress who can't do what they do. If 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 GDPR gave you the right to be forgotten, which is essentially getting rid of data hoarding, kind of in a way, if you want it, and if you want, so kind of along the same line, same lines, and it's completely not Capital One, but still is. I don't think companies should. I don't think you should have to opt out. I think you should have to opt in, and the companies don't automatically get that. That's my personal opinion on that. Right. I, I don't think we're going to change that though. Oh, uh, they make Facebook's yeah. entire business model is based on you opting out. Yeah. Uh, if you opt out, there's no more Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg goes from being worth like 50 there, billion. There's no of, more Instagram. There's no more Facebook. I mean, there's no more Google. There's none. Any there's of no that. more Amazon. Think of Amazon sales. The moment you opt out of Amazon, I did that. So I, I, I bought this anti adware thing and, and I run these tests for other podcasts called goodbye privacy. And then I talk about it. And, I brought this anti-adware, downloaded it, put it on my computer, and then I went into Amazon and I did all the same exact stuff. And then I took my other laptop, adware. I gotta tell you, man, I was buying more when 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 I had ads enabled on my on my device than when I had ads disabled. Because oh, when yeah. ads were disabled, I wasn't getting any more suggestions. There were no suggestions. Yeah, the algorithms, man. There was no suggestions. There was no oh. You're buying water. Get cups. You're like, but I'm <laughs> buying bottles. Who puts a bottle in a cup? You know, it, it's, it's unless it's beer, it shouldn't go from a bottle to a cup. It, it's kind of like, uh, oh, what was that DVR that w- when you actually clicked on it, it would say, hey, you're looking at a lot of, you know, westerns and stuff. And then your girlfriend or wife would come along, do a couple, you know, uh, rom coms on there. And all of a sudden, what, TiVo? Like TiVo. So, the other day I was looking at fly fishing equipment and all of a sudden mm-hmm. every single website I went to is like, Hey, Orvis, Orvis, Orvis. And don't get me wrong. I like Orvis. I buy it from them, but I just found it. Yeah. Kind of along that same line. The, I wish I could block that out sometimes. Well, thank you for coming, Daniel. Hey, my pleasure. I really appreciate it, man. Absolutely. I hope we do this again. I hope we get you on to talk about healthcare and, and HIPAA and, and the challenges you guys have there. Uh, yeah, we will. We will do that, absolutely. Uh, that one I do have to run through marketing. That's fine. Okay. This one was, hey, marketing folks, just so you know, I called him on a random morning. He did. And I, I said, you want to talk smack on LinkedIn? Do it on camera. <laughs> That's where we do it. 
And I was like, I'm down. Let's step outside. So, <laughs> so we're taking this to the studio. <laughs> I was like, all right. And and the meme for this should be like, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, that movie with Ben Stiller. Dodgeball. Dodgeball. Cyber dodgeball. Got to throw a cyber. Cyber in dodgeball. Yeah, cyber dodgeball. That's 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 what this is titled. Cyber ESPN dodgeball. ESPN the Ocho. <laughs> Yes, and you can take the LinkedIn stuff. But that's it, Daniel. Thanks for being here, guys. My thanks for listening, watching. A big thank you to our um, sponsor and supporters. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Give us five stars. Um, if you have questions, feedback, I'm sure we'll try to get Daniel back on. Or maybe we'll um, have him at one of our meetups around town or at CyberHub Summit or wherever that is. So come interact. Say hello. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back uh, next week with more great content.